You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio, and I am your hostess, Pat Rulo, always bringing you a guest who has something a bit out of the ordinary to share with you. And today, I'm especially thrilled to introduce you to a 17-year-old political activist, a filmmaker, and a journalist from the Cleveland, Ohio area. Now, I met this young man through our new youth-driven internet radio station called Those Radio Kids at thoseradiokids.com. He offered to share his weekly journalistic episodes with us, so now he is a regular on our station. He is Andrew Demeter. Let me tell you a bit about him. His documentary, We the People, Genetically Modified, won first prize in C-SPAN's 2014 student camp competition. And so to receive his award, he visited the Capitol in Washington, D.C., where he met and questioned and former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi on matters concerning the National Security Agency's metadata collection. He recorded the short confrontation with his phone, and the video after that went viral online. He also has a YouTube channel titled Teen Take that features his extreme attention to detail videos on subjects that range from covering Obama's speech at the City Club in Cleveland to calling out Monsanto to chemtrails, the TSA, and he interviews some important and very notable guests. He is my new hero, so we're going to get started. I'm going to welcome you to the show, Andrew. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, many people your age, not all, but many, are concerned about yabbering on social media about frivolous topics, who wore what and who said what to whom. What triggered your interest to become involved with these heavy yet important issues? Absolutely. Why would you bother to concern yourself with politics, Pat, when you could just look at pictures of Kim Kardashian all day or watch <laughs> sports game? It's uh, it's a no-brainer, it would seem, but... As far as how I got into this being a teenager, it really all started because of the Internet. One summer I was with one of my friends and we were watching YouTube videos, and long story short, we came across one by Jesse Ventura, and it was uh, an old TV show that he filmed called Conspiracy Theory, and it was specifically an episode on the Denver airport Mm -hmm. and all these ominous signs and symbols over it. So that really got me questioning on this alternative path of, you know, it is everything that the government tells us true, and it really led me on this journey to where I've ended up now to really question things in a different light. And just, you know, my own personal drive has uh, has triggered me to do this. Wow, and that was an interesting video. I saw that as well. And, and when I first heard about the Denver airport and wh- where all the concourses are shaped like a swastika, is that is that correct? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy stuff. If that didn't grab your attention, I don't know what. Um, Now, I know you're in high school and you're juggling school and your interest in journalism and filmmaking. Give us a typical day in the life of Andrew. A typical day. So if we're talking as far as weekdays, I go to school, wake up in the morning, of course, eat breakfast like any other normal human being, and uh, go to school, I get home uh, later in the day. Sometimes I work out, sometimes I don't. And then... As far as, you know, earlier in the week, I usually brainstorm ideas or over the previous weekend, I brainstorm ideas because, like you said earlier, I do try to post one video report or interview per week. So I usually brainstorm the weekend before or, um, you know, get ideas the beginning of the week. And then uh, if it's a news recap type of video, I do my research, of course, early in the week, order props off of Amazon or whatever if I need them to, you know, convey my message in a more entertaining and engaging way. Then midweek, I usually finish up and finalize the script uh, and then ideally film it because editing takes a day or two. And then I usually post the, uh, the news clip or the news summary that I'm reporting on. And then if it's an interview, I usually, it usually takes about two weeks to edit those. So, and of course, I have like a list of probably like 25 people I want to interview. So I'm pursuing those and, and sort of crossing them off the list slowly but surely. So that's really a typical day uh, in my life. Not mm-hmm. Nothing too interesting, but uh, my day nonetheless. No, I think it's extremely interesting because there's a lot of research that goes into creating an excellent documentary such as you do. So I don't know how you find the time to to be a good student and to be good at this as well, but obviously you're managing that very well. Yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely a tricky balance to find, but like you mentioned with the documentary, that was even a, a much more involved process that took many months, of course, and it's just really amazing because, you know, I used to previously just watch TV, watch movies, and think really nothing of it, but 
all the behind the scenes work that goes into it, all the hours worth of interview you, interviews you do, and all that really boils down to just a couple minutes in length. So there's definitely a lot of work going on behind the scenes as well. Absolutely. People see a little short take and they think, oh, well, that was easy, <laughs> not realizing how much time goes into that. So I commend you on that. Now, we're going to talk about that documentary on GMOs shortly, but I want to stick with, uh, with you and ask you this. How do your peers react to you and what you're doing? That's a really great question, of course. Like we prefaced earlier, a lot of people my age just simply aren't interested in these issues, excuse me, and understandably so, they'd rather be preoccupied with these other vapid topics. But most people, at least from what I perceive, people my age, at least that I see on a daily basis in school, for example, a lot of them, whether or not they agree with what I'm saying, at least I know that many of them are actually watching my videos. It helps to push them out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And again, whether or not they agree with my viewpoints, that's completely fine. I want people to, you know, find these answers for themselves and not, you know, blindly accept what I'm putting out there. But either way, at least they are hearing this information. And again, they can draw their own conclusions. But for example, since I created that documentary, we had a, this, uh, C-SPAN, who was hosting the competition, they came to my school one day and presented the video in front, of the, in front of the sophomore class at the time. And, you know, again, at least it gets people thinking on this track because prior to that, I guarantee you no one in my school would know what Monsanto or GMOs are. But at least, again, they, they hear that word. And even if, even if it's the, you know, punchline to a joke they make about me, for example, at least they they have that in their brain is basically the bottom line. Wow, and that takes a little bit of tough skin as well because sometimes you know it feels hurtful when you are the you know, the punchline of a joke, I would imagine. But the bottom line is you are putting yourself out there to help others and not to tell them what to think, but rather to think. Absolutely, it's really not about me and I know that probably sounds cliche, but it's not about me, you know, if I get made fun of, for example, whether it's someone in school, which at least I don't see if that's happening, nor do I really care being mm -hmm. offended is, is kind of stupid in my eyes. But it's not about me. It's about this larger idea, like you said, Pat, of spreading these messages, spreading this information, because at the end of the day, that's really what life is all about. It's this process of communication from one person to the next. Absolutely. And boy, aren't we losing that today, huh? Yes, absolutely. I agree. I agree. That's what I'm hoping those radio kids will do and get people off of their, their cell phones and stop the, the texting and the, the fooling around with foolishness and maybe try to put something together similar as you are to affect some positive changes. Now, are there any others? I mean, is there anyone that you know of in your age group with the same focus? And I know that you were trying to fund a project for news, uh, news and political broadcasting network that would be run entirely by teenagers. Are you finding, is there anyone out there with a similar mindset? It's funny you mention that because when I first read the newspaper ad or article that was written about those radio kids, that was the first thing that popped up into my head. And uh, I was thinking, you know, is someone trying to steal my idea? Of course, intellectual property in my mind is, is absurd to begin with. But, um, you know, I heard that and I was like, oh, this is, this is great. But, yeah, as far as the project I was doing over this past summer, it was called Politicast, and I was trying to fund the first teen news network, so to speak. The scale and or the size and scope of it was really uh, not determined, which in hindsight I'm kind of happy it failed, um, at least the scale I was trying to do it on, because it would have been quite the undertaking, especially, as you mentioned, while being in high school at the same time. But excuse me, to answer your question, you know, am I finding other people engaged in the topics I'm talking about? The answer to that is, you know, overwhelming, well, not overwhelmingly, mm -hmm. but some people, yes, that is the case, whether it be locally, nationally, even globally, being, uh, you know, on the stage that I am, the platform I am, I have had people from over, around the world contact me, and some of those people are actually my age. In Canada, for example, I know a girl named Rachel, she's a GMO activist as well, She's given TED Talks before, and it's just really empowering to know this. And going off of your point earlier as well, Pat, you said we need to get people off their phones and stop texting. But at the same time, technology is really this double-edged sword. We can, you know, waste it looking up pictures of Miley Cyrus or whatever or, you know, Justin Bieber. But also we can have this power as I've exhibited 
to use this technology to have a global platform and to ultimately, you know, bring this information into, you know, daily lives of people. I, I will correct myself. I am definitely not against technology, but just the wise use of it. Right. Like I said, it's a double-edged sword. It can be used for great good, and it can also be used for negative things like uh, NSA for, NSA surveillance, for example, mm -hmm. which is, like you said in the introduction, what I confronted Pelosi on. Yep, yep. Now, I would venture to state this comment. Teens are traditionally politically apathetic, and I actually think we could take this a step further. Many people are politically apathetic, and I think in part because, really, who has time to understand all the mumbo-jumbo that goes on? And, and so it's hard to even wrap your head around politics. What are your thoughts on this? Right. That's one of the main focuses of Politicast. When I was trying to launch it, I said, like you said, teens are politically apathetic, but so are adults. So it's, it seems like we've really distanced ourselves from politics because they're complicated. And that was the, my sort of motto for Politicast was going to be simplification of information without dilution of content. So I wanted to simplify things, of course, to the point where they could be easily understood and easily accessible, easily digestible information. But at the same time, I didn't want to dilute the content to the point where it's really not news or information at all. So yes, that's absolutely true. And I think it's kind of ironic as well being in, excuse me, the country we're in where we're supposed to be such a, you know, important and critical part of the political process. We're really seeing, it seems like right now we're being distanced from this process and politicians don't seem to really care whether or not their constituents uh, like what they're doing after they're voted into office. It seems like they can uh, just really do whatever they want and not have any accountability. I think it was uh, Paul Revere, and I don't think that was the right person, but someone said a quote once, and it was something to the effect of promises cost nothing, and I think that's really telling of what the current political state of affairs is in America. I absolutely agree with you 100%. I like what you said, you're trying to, the simplification of information without the, the dilution of uh, the message. Is that what you said? Content, yeah. Con yeah. Okay, yeah, exactly. And that's what you're aiming to do. Right, and that's even recently uh, with Teen Take, I've started creating, I still do interviews which tend to be longer in length, but I've also been recently producing just one to two minute news recaps of, of news stories, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And I think that's more effective because, it, you know, people don't want to sit and listen to, you know, a teenager, for example, just talking into a teleprompter and a camera for 10 minutes about his, you know, personal ideas and thoughts. Instead, they just want a quick, entertaining video, which I try to do, like I said, with props, for example, and I, I try to integ integrate pop culture as well into my videos to sort of target that youth demographic, even if in a very small way. So ideally, it's, uh, it's you know, engaging the youth and making them hopefully more informed. Yeah, I think that's a great idea to keep them short and tight, kind of a Sesame Street type of a concept and have them sizzle and fast and get the message across. Now, let's talk about your documentary on GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Why did you pick that as your topic? So the prompt for the competition itself, the C-SPAN competition called Student Cam, the prompt was what important issue should Congress address this year? And it was last year, so 2014. And at first I was thinking topics like drone strikes or the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows uh, the military to indefinitely detain any American citizen without habeas corpus or, you know, probable cause. So those were the first things that popped into my head. But uh, initially just trying to contact some people to interview, like politicians, for example, none of them, you know, surprisingly, were willing to discuss these very controversial issues. So I figured, well, let's still pick a controversial issue, but make it one that maybe affects a lot more people, so it would also be easier to you know, book interviews with these people. So I eventually decided on GMOs, genetically modified organisms, because you know, put simply, GMOs affect everyone. Everyone requires food, and you know, food is just such an essential part of life that we see on the grocery shelves every day yet we don't take the time to actually read the label or, or think anything of it. We sort of just blindly ingest these uh, toxic chemicals on a daily basis. So uh, that was, you know, the first part. And then the second aspect of it, which is all this, you know, conflict of interest and just 
complete, you know, insanity with these uh, with these uh, corporate entities and then the the public sec- sector of government. I don't think people really realize what's going on behind the scenes either, which you do bring out very clearly on that video. So, what did you learn from all of that as you were doing your research and creating that? What did you learn that say surprised you? Funnily enough. Funnily, I don't think that's actually a word, but I like it. You know, <laughs> ironically, out of the whole research process, I learned less about GMOs, or I didn't learn necessarily anything, you know, too, uh, you know, shockingly new about GMOs. But instead, I learned a lot about, like you said, the behind-the-scenes aspect mm-hmm. of this, which is that initially I tried booking people for interviews, like I said, politicians, farmers who had local farmers markets. Um, grocers, et cetera, people all involved in some way in the food industry. And shockingly, at first, they immediately agreed to do an interview. They said, well, they implied, you know, oh, C-SPAN's a credible organization. They're unbiased. So I know that my opinions won't be skewed in any, you know, uh, false way or falsely represent my opinions. So, um, you know, they were first said they first agreed to do the interviews and said, oh, yeah, you know, sure, this this sounds great. And then last minute for so many of them, like doctors as well, physicians, um, they sort of just backed out and said, you know, oh, I I either am <laughs> – here, let's take one example, for instance. Um, there was one doctor I was trying to interview, and initially, like I said, he was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd be glad to do this interview. And so we scheduled a date and time and everything, and then just the night before – he actually emailed me back and said, you know, I'm actually unqualified to talk about this issue, which in my interpretation, in other words, meant that, you know, my organization doesn't want me Mm -hmm. talking about Mm -hmm. this. I don't want to put my job on the line for saying anything controversial. And it was the same case with politicians. So, again, it's just so interesting to me that these issues affect everyone, yet it's seemingly so controversial and so taboo that nobody wants to talk about it. Well, the least we know, the less fuss we can make about it, then there will be no change to the system. So it, it's it, exactly, exactly. I mean, we could talk about journalism there. That's kind of at the crux of a lot of the matter here. There's no journalism that really goes on anymore, or maybe it never did, but mainstream media is afraid to ask real questions. And I sit and shout at the TV when I attempt to become informed via the television. And media doesn't ask the right questions. They never really challenge the government. In fact, the press is the right arm of the government and of big business, and we're only fed what we're supposed to hear. So there's quite a bit of hypocrisy there. For example, in the 60s, I believe it was, there was a little-known program. Now I think it's, you know, publicly public knowledge, and it's been, you know, uh, redacted or unredacted. It's been made public that uh, in the 60s there was a government program called Operation Mockingbird in which basically... Uh, money for the Marshall Plan in Europe was siphoned uh, by the American government to uh, journalists to, you know, in no uncertain terms, bribe them to basically regurgitate White House talking points. So it should be no surprise. And like you said, with all these corporate media outlets who are owned by these large advertisers like pharmaceutical companies, for example, which no surprise, they play all those commercials during the during dinner time when people are eating because, again, the food is so toxic, it's uh, it's uh, they're, they're advertising basically at the right time. And all these media outlets are owned by these corporate entities. And so they're then beholden to them and they're not going to insult or bite the hand that feeds them. Absolutely. And as you're saying this, I'm thinking of something I didn't plan on talking about this, but it kind of raises an issue when we were talking about technology. Well, now we've got the smart meters that are attached to our homes and those are going to sync with these smart appliances. And let's take, for example, the smart TVs. Now we're sitting there watching TV while the TV is watching us. And let's say, you know, we're having a husband and wife's having an argument or the kids are fussing about what cereal to eat or what snack they want. And now the ads can or eventually will be able to be targeted towards what's going on in that individual living room. Right, Pat. It seems like as these appliances, as this technology is becoming smarter and smarter, we as people are becoming dumber and dumber. Mm. We're becoming more reliant on it and it's being used against us. And that also brings into, uh, you know, conversation, a recent interview I did with uh, John McAfee, who was a pioneer of the antivirus software, McAfee Antivirus, and he was telling me that now actually in toasters, some toasters have Wi-Fi signals, and through that they can actually surveil us. So it's no surprise, again, all this corporate and government intimacy that's going on, these conflicts of interest, 
and we're just being surveilled every day. And again, it's another issue that is so, you know, uh, you know, evanescent or rather uh, present in our daily lives. Yet again, nobody wants to talk about it because we're not hearing it on media because. Uh, again, they're beholden to their corporate sponsors. So if we're not hearing it from the media, the fourth estate supposedly of the government, uh, we're not going to be hearing about it because a lot of people just rely on the media and think that they're trustworthy entities yep. and uh, they're not going to question things for themselves, which is why, for example, the Internet is so powerful because it decentralizes all this information. It decentralizes uh, the government control of these narratives, and that's why... Uh, again, while it is a double-edged sword, I find it so empowering personally. Yeah, yeah. Well, was it General Petraeus that said, we will spy on you through your dishwasher? <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. So no smart appliances in this house. How's that? Um, let's get back for a second. Let's jump back to uh, genetically modified food and organisms. What do you think we can do as individuals? I hate to always talk about the problems and not offer some sort of a solution. What can we do as individuals to put an end to this food war? I would say, first off, your best bet is to simply research online, read books, do whatever you need to, you know, and come in contact with this information. Excuse me. And then from that, you know, when you're at the grocery store, don't 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 just pick up the brand name product. Instead, you know, look at the label, see if it's organic. If it's USDA organic, even it can still have up to a five percent margin of um, you know inorganic ingredients, which is shocking to me. But uh, look for non-GMO products that are uh, you know not genetically modified. So you know, take the power into your own hands. Now even apps exist that uh, you can simply scan the barcode of these food products and it'll tell you if it's genetically modified or not because that's one of the main problems. Monsanto, for example, this large agricultural uh, biotech business that basically funds GMOs and is responsible for them, they are actually funding now um, initiatives to not only make it so uh, they don't have to label genetically modified products, but instead they're going a step further and actually trying to invest all this money into it and lobby to make it illegal to label these products. Oh. So that's that's one way. Uh, look at labels uh, when you shop. And then another way that sort of, you know, not everyone can do this, obviously, but recently I went to downtown Cleveland, Ohio City, and spoke and interviewed with uh, Bobby George. He's the owner of Town Hall, which is a 100% non-GMO restaurant in Cleveland, so we're seeing really now the tides shift, Pat. We're seeing that people are no longer, you know, while maybe a majority of people still are unaware of these issues, the market at the end of the day, like with everything, the free market dictates the success of things. So if everyone, so at the end of the day, really, all you can do is educate people because if genetically modified organisms truly are unsafe, then the market will decide that. And because of that, because we, uh, you know, vote with our dollars, we will ultimately shift the tides to a more uh, healthy alternative. Absolutely. And we talk about that on the program all the time. I mean, you have to hit them where it hurts, and that's the pocketbook. So if we refuse to buy those types of foods and they're not selling, well, then maybe someone will hear us. Yeah? Absolutely. Because, of course, at least in my opinion, we really can't rely on these flip-flopping politicians anymore. Again, we need to take that power into our own hands. And like you said, hit them where it hurts because these politicians are unaccountable, but at the end of the day, uh, money talks, so we need to, uh, you know, take that alternative route. That's right, right. I mean, so these types of foods are a health issue. I, I think they've been proven to, to be so, or even logically you think about it, that, uh, you know, you're eating insecticides. It's probably not a healthy thing. And since this is a show on healthcare safety, what do you see as the most serious and impending health issues? Well, I'd say, you know, given the topic of this discussion, I'd say GMOs because Monsanto, for example, well, you know, no surprise, they say um, GMOs are safe, which is kind of the equivalent of asking, you know, uh, your your son or daughter who just had their hand in the cookie jar and has chocolate over the, all over their face, you know, did you steal from the cookie jar? Did you eat a cookie? And they say, oh, well, no, of course I didn't do that. I mean, it's a complete conflict of interest. So to ask that question and get an answer from Monsanto is completely hypocritical. So 
GMOs are a big issue for me because, like I said, uh, Monsanto is funding all these studies. And like you said as well, Pat, logically, is it smart to ingest an, an insecticide or a pesticide? It doesn't make much sense to me. And recently on French television, I believe, there was a Monsanto representative being interviewed, interviewed and the interviewer said to him, you know, oh, in all this literature you write, you say, uh, Roundup is safe, glyphosate is safe, you can even uh, go as far to consume it. So um, I actually have some in the back room. Would you like to try some? And then the, uh, guy, be, the guy being interviewed, the uh, Monsanto representative, he you know, freaks out and immediately leaves the interview. So if that's not telling, uh, you know, I really don't know what is. Mm-hmm. Just last evening, I saw a commercial for Monsanto, and I hadn't seen this before, where I think it was showing a family eating at a big table and all this luscious-looking food and obviously corn on the cob. And just seeing that commercial made me think, all right, what, what are they trying to whitewash here? I mean, you'd never seen a commercial for Monsanto before. And it's all under the guise, too, Pat, of feeding the world, saving the world. Mm-hmm. What other you know, noble cause would you have uh, other than that? You know, it sounds great superficially, and... Personally, for me, you know, maybe biotechnology, although I don't think we should mess with Mother Nature, maybe by itself it's okay, but, you know, you have to separate that, the science of it, from these corrupt business practices. For example, um, the, uh, the Obama administration in 2013 signed something called the Farmer's Assurance Provision, otherwise known as the Monsanto Protection Act, mm-hmm. and it literally gives Monsanto judicial immunity Pat, as individuals, you know, you can't, you know, have judicial immunity. I can't have judi- judicial immunity. We can't go rob a bank together and, you know, expect no repercussions. But for Monsanto, even though, you know, of course, as they say, their products are completely safe and completely healthy, there's no concerns whatsoever, they, you know, have this um, judicial immunity so they can't be prosecuted if anything they produce is. Uh, you know, hazardous or toxic, which I find, you know, absolutely uh, incredible. Exactly. And then you can tie that to the vaccine industry. Well, they've got that same type of protection that they can't be sued for anything that they manufacture or inject in another person or even the telecom industry where the cell towers, I mean, they can put them wherever they want. People could get sick and you can't fuss about that. So anytime there's a, a law protecting the company against your health, I think we need to think twice about that. Absolutely. It should be a red flag to everyone. Again, you know, individuals can't have this type of immunity, this type of protection. So why on earth should uh, these these multi-billion dollar companies have them in place? And also going back to the conflict of interest that I, you know, alluded to earlier, Michael Taylor, for example, Mm -hmm. as I see in the documentary, former vice president for public policy at Monsanto, is also the current food safety czar at the FDA. So again, it just is, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's equally hilarious, the fact that, you know, this is happening and nobody seems to be batting an eye when, you know, the implications are so great. That whole revolving door that goes on between big business and politics and uh, people just allow that to happen and don't think twice. Well, you think there's a conflict of interest? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, I just have so many questions for you. And you kind of tend to step out and interview some interesting people and, and to have some topics that might have some repercussions. Let me ask you this. Are you afraid of any repercussions from listeners or maybe even the government who may not like what you have to say? Well, I do have a relative, actually, who works for a government agency as far as intelligence is concerned, and he did, and, you know, we're not really that close. We don't talk too often, and he seemed dead serious when he said it that, uh, uh, this was prior, actually, to my confrontation with Pelosi, so apparently just by producing videos online, this is what happened. He said that he had seen my name on paperwork cross his desk before, so, uh, you know, maybe I'm doing something right. My aunt tells me to wear <laughs> that as a badge of honor because, you know, if the government is against you and if the government is this nefarious entity that, in my opinion, I see it is, um, you know, then that must mean by default I'm doing something right. So as far as repercussions from the government, you know, I don't know, maybe there's a lot of people online who do similar stuff and they don't see the repercussions. Some of them, you know, they have such a big audience that if anything were to happen, it would, uh, you know, spark some uh, mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, make people raise some eyebrows. So as far as government, I'm not too concerned, but, um, you know, as far as potential jobs in the future and, and other related things, I mean, yeah, it obviously 
you know, puts a restriction on that to some extent. And I was on Fox News a while ago on uh, Neil Cavuto's show, and I basically, uh, you know, subtly called out Fox News saying that a lot of reporters um, won't confront politicians like I did because they're, again, like I mentioned earlier in this interview, they're beholden to their advertisers and everything. And uh, Neil actually smiled a little bit at that. So, you know, is that going to affect uh, me ever getting on Fox News again? I'm not entirely sure. But, yes, by, uh, you know, going outside the box, by, uh, you know, swimming against the current, going against, going against the grit, you obviously do, uh, you know, stick out. And whether or not that's a benefit, um, you know, or a detriment, mm-hmm. uh, I guess uh, time will tell. I'd rather be in your shoes than not. And, you know, we talked about this Nancy Pelosi confrontation, and it wasn't like you even asked a question the way you were trying to poke at her. You asked an honest question. Tell us about that question. And actually, it was her answer that created the whole viral situation. If, if it was a normal, intelligent answer, it would have been end of the day. Nobody would have paid attention. Tell us <laughs> briefly about that. So the Pelosi confrontation dovetails from my documentary, C-SPAN Flew the Top, Four Winners Out to Washington, D.C., so I was there. And long story short, one of the last days we were on the trip, we got to meet with Pelosi. Um, And so when I was there, uh, she first asked everyone who created the documentary, the four or five of us, she said, so uh, do any of you have questions uh, pertinent to your documentaries that you'd like to ask me? So... Uh, I was the last person to actually ask a question, fortunately so, otherwise it probably would have been pretty awkward just standing there and, you know, looking at her. But long story short, um, I said, well, my documentary is about GMOs, but I have a question relating to the, the gentleman that spoke before me, Peter, and he had created a documentary on the NSA, so I said, you know, I have a question relating to Peter's documentary about the NSA, And I said, why do you support the NSA's illegal and ubiquitous data collection? And her (laughs) response was just, you know, like you said, Pat, uh, uh, astounding. If she would have simply said, you know, well, I I really shouldn't have supported it or I support it because I think Americans are evil and they should be surveilled, that would be one (laughs) thing. But instead of answering that question, she sort of stumbles on her words, obviously not expecting this. She thought it was going to be a photo opportunity to mm-hmm. lay at hand and everything. But she stutters and, and, you know, appears very nervous. And then by the end, she just, you know, uh, it, it ensues to blame the Bush administration. And I am personally, uh, you know, classify or describe myself as a libertarian, so I'm not for Democrats or for Republicans. But to just see, you know, it's so representative, again, of politics right now in this country. It's just this blame game. If something goes wrong, no, it's not your fault. You don't take personal responsibility. Instead, it's, you know, your opponent's fault. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's basically how that confrontation went out. And then, of course, it, it went uh, viral on the Internet. Yeah, I guess if she didn't have her talking points, she didn't know how to answer you. And she surely wasn't expecting that kind of a question, I guess. Right, just like Obama without a teleprompter, uh, things uh, don't go as planned. (laughs) And then even, too, I should mention uh, her legislative aide in the corner. You can hear it in the video. Mm -hmm. But she actually, when Pelosi didn't really answer my initial question, then I followed up and said, uh, you know, this is a violation of the Fourth Amendment, isn't it? And the legislative aide, you know, sensing the awkwardity of the situation, tries to jump in and interrupt me and cut me off and says, oh, thanks everyone for coming. So, uh, you know, it was it was just uh, a really unique and uh, very telling encounter. Well, I'm glad you had that opportunity to kick off your career. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure, to be fair, that nothing like that will happen again. Going back to, you know, repercussions, I don't think I'll be uh, invited (laughs) to speak with Pelosi anytime soon. And, uh, you know, she probably has a restraining order pending on me as we speak. Well, when you go to Amazon to order your props, get like a, get a mustache and, you know, a mask or something. (laughs) I actually did use one of those in my recent TSA video. So, uh, you know, the glasses and the... Oh, I saw that. The mustache. So uh, there you go. (laughs) You have that. I saw that. That was great. I've watched many of your videos. They're awesome. I'm going to encourage everyone to go there and we'll give that information in a minute um since you're still in school tell us this what's going on in schools today is anyone learning anything of value anymore are we just needlessly testing everyone to death it seems you know actually tomorrow i'll be taking the act test for college entrance and i just find it so you know disturbing obviously i understand there's a a high demand for kids to go to college these days because of you know, the very hyper-competitive job market, but at the same time, 
you know, just going through the college process in its nascent stages, you know, some of these colleges won't even talk to you or won't even consider your application if you don't have above this arbitrary number of a mm -hmm. score. And it's really disappointing that, you know, it's really, I wouldn't call it discrimination, but it's just this, you know, prejudice almost that, oh, well, you know, for, for all we know, a lot of people could just be haphazardly answering and bubbling in uh, letters on their, on their, you know, grade cam sheet type thing. But these colleges, you know, apparently, uh, you know, a number is more important to them than the actual, you know, content of someone's character, which I find very disappointing. But as far as school specifically, um, you know, it is sort of disappointing at some points because, you know, personally I'm not interested in chemistry, for example. Of course, there is some involvement with GMOs, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician either. And in some of these subjects, you just really, you know, want to question, when, I'm, when am I going to use this in life? What's its practical application? And, you know, to me it's just frustrating to sort of have to be forced through some of this curriculum when I could be, for example, you know, being more productive with my time and actually, you know, taking pleasure in producing videos, for example. Um, but, you know, it's still, it, you know, things could be much worse, mm -hmm. but uh, it's still a little bit frustrating at times. Yeah, I can imagine. You're in 11th grade now? Correct. Yeah, okay, so you got one more year. What are your goals for your future after high school? Well, after high school, I'm looking currently to pursue something in journalism or communications to sort of, uh, you know, expand my knowledge and hone my, my skills as a reporter and as a, you know, communicator in the future. So those are my future plans. And beyond that, um, you know, I'm still not unsure or I'm still not certain for sure uh, the future is a little foggy at this point, but uh, and people have asked me this before. They say, "Oh, do you want to run for run for office?" And to that, I say, "No, I just don't want to rule anyone. Uh, you know, you can you can make your own decisions. I don't feel the need to sort of rule over people. And it seems like even if people go into office with good intentions, mm -hmm. it it doesn't end so well, yeah. and uh, they sort of get corrupted along the process. So my answer to that is no. I'm not interested in becoming a politician at this point." or hopefully ever in the future. Yeah, yeah, the system is the system doesn't allow good people to stay good and you don't need to know what you're going to do in the future. No one really does actually. It's the whole journey that's the uh, that's the joy, I think. Very true. Yeah, yeah. Well, now is there anything that you'd like to talk about that you feel is important that we didn't at least touch on today? I just think politics are so important for people to, you know, take an interest in because there's a quote that goes, if you don't take an interest in politics, they'll take an interest in you. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand they seem boring at the at the surface level, but try to, you know, you don't have to read the newspaper every day or read all these articles online about foreign policy and stuff that seemingly doesn't affect us, even though it really does. But I'd say just, you know, find some sort of uh, topic and basically anything at this point is is related to the state in some way because the state you know has this overbearing uh, autonomy or or grasp rather over us. So uh, I just say find a topic you're interested, pursue that, look into its uh, you know implications in insofar as government, and then from that you will become a more informed person. Obviously, no one holds the uh, ultimate key to knowledge, but it's it's really just all about inform informing yourself and then ultimately educating others to sort of further that brush fire. That's so true. And, you know, once you are made aware of something, it's almost your responsibility to share it and inform others. Right. That's just, you know, the general concept of, of why people share things online, for example. If something's a good idea, going back to the free market, it will catch on and, uh, you know, it will ultimately affect other people. And that's mm -hmm. why we, uh, we share our knowledge with other people because, uh, you know, we find it so important to our own life and then we want people to, you know, ideally accept that if it's true and, you know, make it pertinent and relevant to their lives as well. Right. Now, you cover so many topics. What do you like to ponder? What really fuels your passion? That's, uh, that's another tough question. Oh, okay. Uh, I would say, you know, GMOs is, is one of my general focuses. Um, beyond that, you know, science interests me. I'm not that well versed in it. Um, religion as well, war. Uh, war particularly. Recently mm -hmm. I interviewed uh, anti-war activist uh, Cindy Sheehan, who in 2005 was protesting outside George Bush's Texas ranch um, because her son was killed in the war in Iraq. And uh, so, you know, war just continues to perplex me. It's, uh, you know, so sad that these 
you know, elitists and these people in government view soldiers really as uh, pawns, pawns of war mm -hmm. to ultimately, you know, get nothing more than territory and, and natural resources like oil. So that's, uh, that's so, you know, perplexing to me again that uh, human beings are, are seen as uh, these, you know, uh, uh, renewable resources, if you will. And then also uh, a, another thing, too, is... Uh, this whole idea of animal rights, and uh, personally, I'm a vegetarian, and I also find it really perplexing. A lot of people who are, you know, so inclined for freedom and liberty, uh, they also conversely, you know, kill and eat animals. Mm -hmm. So that also perplexes me. Um, so those are a couple things that I like to uh, ponder to answer your question. Mm -hmm. A lot going on in your brain, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I know there's so much more. I just love talking with you. This is just fun for me. So we could do this all day, but I know you've... Happy to come on again. Yeah, we'll have to do this. I know you've got lots more to do. So where can we find out more about you? Where can folks go to learn more about Andrew and Teen Take? YouTube.com forward slash Teen Take, T-E-E-N-T-A-K-E is the best place to go. You can also find me on Facebook. Uh, my personal page is just Andrew Demeter, D-E-M-E-T-E-R. And I have a Facebook fan page for Teen Take as well. Same thing, Facebook.com slash Teen Take. I also have Twitter, Demeter, uh, forward slash Demeter, Andrew. And those are basically all the places you can uh, find me. I have been recently uploading new video reports every Saturday at noon. So uh, that's where you can find me. This weekend, I will be posting the interview, like I mentioned earlier, with uh, Bobby George, founder or uh, owner rather of Town Hall, the non-GMO restaurant. And then the weekend after that, I will be posting my recent inter interview with Shirley Phelps Roper, who is the uh, you know uh, you know spokesperson for the Westboro Baptist Church, which. Uh, that that was a particularly fun interview. I saw that you interviewed her. That's going to be very, very interesting. I've listened to most of yours, and I'm really going to encourage everyone to take a peek at everything you do because uh, they're done extremely well. And here's what I say. We need more Andrews in this world, questioning, thinking, researching, and speaking up. And so I congratulate you on being you and for setting a huge, important example, not only for today's youth, but for all of us. And I am proud to know you. And I'm so glad you were with us today. Thanks, Pat, again. It's been a real pleasure. I uh, had a great conversation. And folks, remember, you can also find Andrew on our own internet radio site, thoseradiokids.com. <laughs> <laughs>